Did you hear about the Florida man who pulled a gun on the drive through worker at Starbucks because there was no cream cheese on his bagel? Did you see that about a week or two ago? It happened in Miami Gardens, Florida, which is just outside of Miami. Thankfully, no one was hurt. The man's name is Omar Wright. Omar went through the drive through got his bagel, realized there was no cream cheese on the bagel, went back through the drive through pulled out a gun, made his displeasure known. <laughs> what makes the story even more humorous to me, though, is that the lady working the drive through happened to be the daughter of the local police chief. So that didn't go over too well. Omar was arrested the next day. He was charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. And when he finally got out of jail, he gave this quote to reporters. Always go to Dunkin' Donuts, never Starbucks. <laughs> you know, there are a lot of strange things that take place in drive throughs there was a couple that was going through a drive through at Wendy's one night. They had ordered a wild berry shake. And as they pulled around to the window, they were in a fierce argument with each other about who was going to pay. She wanted him to pay. He said, I'm not going to pay. And so for three minutes, they sat there at the window arguing about who was going to pay. Finally, the man said, just get out of the car. Get out. She said, I'm not getting out. He said, fine, then I'll get out. He turned off the ignition, got out of the car, taking the keys with him, and walked away, <laughs> leaving her in the car stranded there at the drive through A car full of naked people with paper bags on their heads visited a McDonald's one day, as did an entire funeral procession, including the hearse. <laughs> the funeral procession pulled in. Everybody ordered a meal. Apparently, the deceased person really liked McDonald's. And so they did that as a tribute to him. A drive through worker at Tim Hortons was taking a man's order and he thought he heard an elephant. He did. When the pickup truck pulled around, sure enough, there was a baby elephant in the back. One drive through worker reported having a fish thrown at him. They said the person didn't even order food. They just pulled up to the window and threw a fish at me. <laughs> They called it a drive through fishing. <laughs> and I even heard about a woman who was in labor who stopped off at a drive through before going to the hospital. Strange things happen in drive throughs In fact, I've got a couple of personal examples. Both took place at Arby's. Not the same Arby's. But Jill and I went to the Arby's in Fern Creek one day and we ordered our food. We pulled around to the window and there was one car in front of us. And I noticed that they had a dog and that the drive through worker leaned out and started petting the dog. I thought, oh man, I really wish they wouldn't pet the dog and then handle our food. But it got worse. I noticed that she starts motioning for other people to come. And sure enough, there's a crowd of employees each taking their turn petting the dog. Needless to say, when that person pulled off, so did we. And more recently than that, Jill and I were running some errands. We were in Bardstown. We had to go to Shelbyville. And so at about 3 o'clock, we were leaving Shelbyville, and I said, let's stop at Arby's and get a milkshake. It was a beautiful day. Our windows were down. And all of a sudden, the man two cars ahead of us laid on his horn like nobody's business. He didn't just beep the horn. His arm was fully extended, and for 60 seconds, he laid on the horn. At first, I thought it was comical. I kind of laughed it off. But it started to get annoying. People were rolling up their windows. After he got off the horn, he started beating the steering wheel and yelling as loud as he could out the window. Then he went back to laying on the horn again. He literally honked everybody out of the drive through One by one, cars just started pulling off. And as we left, we both agreed... That guy's got some serious anger issues. Well, that leads me into our study today. We're in the midst of a sermon series entitled Proverbs, The Way of Wisdom. We're trying to glean wisdom 
from various truths that are taught in the 20th book of your Bible, the book of Proverbs. So far, we've looked at various Proverbs about laziness and pride. Today, we're going to look at Proverbs about anger. I think anger is something that we all struggle with from time to time. Some struggle with it more than others. Maybe occasionally you get angry. Maybe anger kind of characterizes your whole life. Regardless of where you're at on the scale, I think this lesson will be a blessing and benefit to us all. But let's remind ourselves of an important point, and that is, what, what is a proverb? We use that term, I think we have an idea of what it means, but what is a proverb? A proverb is simply a short statement that conveys a wise principle. Or we might say it's a pithy truth. Our English word proverb is made up of two Latin words, pro meaning instead of, and verba meaning words, instead of words. Hence a proverb is deliberately designed to be succinct. It is deliberately designed to be brief and to the point rather than being many words. Alright? The book of Proverbs is an extremely valuable book if we'll take advantage of it. We should also note that the Hebrew word for Proverbs means a comparison. And throughout the book, we see comparisons being made. Comparisons between wisdom and foolishness, wealth and poverty, humility and pride. And as we'll see today, the patient man and the angry man. Let me begin by saying that anger is not inherently sinful. Alright? There are some times when anger is appropriate. God Himself gets angry on occasion. In Deuteronomy 1 verse 37, Moses said, Even with me the Lord was angry. And Psalm 7 verse 11 says, God is angry with the wicked every day. Our Lord Jesus got angry. In Mark chapter 3, Jesus goes into the synagogue on the Sabbath and he sees a man with a withered hand. Jesus wants to heal this man, but he knows that his enemies are there, the Pharisees. And the Pharisees have their noses up and their arms crossed and they're just waiting for Jesus to heal this man so they could accuse him of violating the Sabbath. Jesus was annoyed by that. He was bothered by their hardness of heart. And verse 5 says, he looked at them with anger. We might call that righteous indignation. Ephesians 4 verse 26 says, be angry, but do not sin. So not all anger is sinful, but most of the time it is. Most of the time when we get angry, we're not getting angry for righteous reasons. It's not a noble anger. Let's be honest. Anger becomes sinful when we get angry too quickly or for the wrong reasons. And that's why the book of Proverbs tells us that we're to be calm and controlled. We're to practice patience. We're to be slow to anger. For instance, Proverbs 14 verse 29. Whoever is slow to anger has great understanding. But he who has a hasty temper exalts folly. Proverbs 15 verse 18. A hot-tempered man stirs up strife. But he who is slow to anger quiets contention. Proverbs 16 verse 32. Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. Proverbs 19 verse 11. Good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. Notice the wise man Solomon, speaking not only through experience but through inspiration, says that the truly wise man, who's, who has insight and understanding, will choose to be slow to anger. He'll be disciplined and practice patience. He'll count down rather than blasting off. And that makes sense because 
when you think about it, being slow to anger is an attribute of God. Did you know God is said to be slow to anger over and over in Scripture? Now, God is obviously the most powerful being in existence. God could destroy us in the blink of an eye. And we certainly have done enough to deserve that. Yet remarkably, the Bible says God is slow to anger. Let me give you some examples. Numbers 14, verse 18. The Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Nehemiah 9, verse 17. You are a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Psalm 86, verse 15. But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Joel 2, verse 13. Return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Don't you want God to be patient with you? To be long-suffering? Does anybody want God to have a short fuse when dealing with their situation? Of course not. We are all absolutely dependent upon God being slow to anger. Well, if you want God to be slow to anger with you, you must be slow to anger with others. And I'll tell you, I struggle with that, especially when I'm driving. I struggle with that. But if I want God to be slow to anger with me, I'd better be slow to anger with others. I don't want him to fly off the handle. I don't want him to lose his cool. Then I shouldn't fly off the handle and lose my cool. The wise man in the book of Proverbs says, You want some wisdom? Let me give you some wisdom. Practice patience. Constrain your anger. You know, sometimes when you're raising kids, you'll enact what we call stranger danger. You'll tell them, now listen, strangers might seem friendly, but they can be dangerous. They could hurt you. And no matter what they say, you know, you keep your guard up and don't leave mom and dad's sight. Well, not only is there stranger danger, but the Bible teaches there's anger danger. There are more Proverbs I'll share with you. Proverbs 22, verses 24 and 25. Make no friendship with a man given to anger, nor go with a wrathful man, lest you learn his ways and entangle yourself in a snare. Proverbs 22, or 29, verse 22. A man of wrath stirs up strife, and one given to anger causes much transgression. Proverbs 30, verse 33. For pressing milk produces curds, pressing the nose produces blood, and pressing anger produces strife. Notice the inherent danger there. Anger can entangle you in a snare. Anger can cause much transgression. Anger can produce strife. You know that first proverb on the screen? Make no friendship with a man given to anger, lest you learn his ways. I'll tell you, other people rub off on us more than we care to admit. I was thinking about that proverb and I remembered a friend, my best friend in fact growing up. But he was incredibly impatient. It didn't take much at all to set him off. I remember when we started driving, he'd pull up to someone's house and they were supposed to come get in the car. And if they didn't immediately come outside, he starts hitting the dashboard. He's stomping his feet. He's getting angry. Hate to admit it, but before long, I found that I was hitting the dashboard, stomping my feet. <laughs> if you always hang out with angry people, chances are you'll start to lose your temper more often. The Bible says don't make friendship with people like that. That'll rub off on you and entangle you in a snare. There's anger danger. It not just hurts the person, 
but it can hurt others. On May the 15th, 1894, the Baltimore Orioles traveled to Boston to play the Boston Bean Eaters at the South End Grounds. Now that's a cool nickname right there, the Bean Eaters. Well, you would think it's just a typical baseball game, but in the third inning, something incredible happened. It started apparently when Boston's Tommy Tucker slid into third base and was intentionally kicked in the face by the Orioles' John McGraw. This started a brawl between the two. It spread. And about that same time, a fire erupted in the outfield bleachers. It was a nine-alarm fire. It ended up burning down the ballpark. It was a beautiful ballpark for that day and age. Burned down the whole ballpark. It spread throughout the community. Over a hundred buildings were totally destroyed and nearly 2,000 people were left homeless. Now some said that the fire started because a man carelessly tossed his cigarette onto some trash. Others said that the fire started because some kids were behind the bleachers and they lit a peanut package on fire. But the most plausible example or reason for the fire, they say, is that the brawl on the field made its way into the stands. Passionate fans lost control of their emotions and somebody set the place on fire. I don't know if that's true, but if it is, doesn't that make a powerful point about the danger of anger? Anger between two men on the field spread into the bleachers, and as a result, not only did this beautiful ballpark get destroyed, but the whole community suffered loss. That's how danger operates. Unchecked anger can break up marriages. It can destroy families. It can end friendships. It can divide churches. And it can cost us our souls. Some people think anger is a sign of strength. They think they're tough if they're angry. Anger is not a sign of strength. It's a sign of weakness. Solomon himself said that the guy who can control his anger is more mighty than he who takes a city. When I see people get angry, I don't think, oh, they're big and bad. I think they're weak and vulnerable. And so we need to be careful. Not only are there Proverbs in Scripture that talk about anger and its danger, but like we've been doing throughout this series, I've tried to find cultural Proverbs as well, uninspired, but informative Proverbs. Here are a few about anger. A Chinese proverb says, not the fastest horse can catch a word spoken in anger. An English proverb says, anger is often more hurtful than the injury that it caused. A French proverb says, anger is a bad counselor. A Korean proverb says, if you kick a stone in anger, you'll hurt your own foot. I like that because it's true. Anger is self-destructive. And a Greek proverb says, one word spoken in anger may spoil an entire life. Well, there is one more proverb I want to look at. It's the one that kind of means the most to me when it comes to anger. Proverbs 15 verse 1. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Boy, those are words to live by. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. I told you about my trip to Pikeville. It was a Sunday morning, went and preached for a church there. They took us to a Chinese buffet. And as we're leaving the buffet, the big road, I think it's a four-lane road on each side there in Pikeville, was fairly empty. It was a Sunday morning. So I just pull out into the corner lane. Well, just as I'm pulling out into the corner lane, a big burly guy in a monster truck decides he wants to make a U-turn. Now, there's still two or three lanes between us. But apparently he felt disrespectful, uh, disrespected. And so unbeknownst to me, as I pull up to the red light, he pulls up and he starts honking his horn. I wrote out my window and he's just fit to be tied. 
Didn't you see me turning up there? Why didn't you wait? And he's going on and on. I'm thinking, now how should I handle that? It was Sunday morning. I was feeling pretty spiritual. (laughs) I just got done preaching, hanging out with brethren. And so when he was done ranting, I just looked at him and I said, man, it's the Lord's day. He paused for a second and said, Yeah, it is. And he took off. (laughs) And that kind of illustrates this proverb, right? A soft answer turns away wrath. Gideon, one of the judges we read about in the book of Judges. I love his humility. He was called upon by God to lead the people out of Midianite oppression. And he said, really? My tribe is the least and I'm the least within my family? You want me? God has a way of using people like that, the humble And so Gideon ends up leading this great military victory against the Midianites. But the men of Ephraim felt slighted. They wondered why he did this without including them. And so in Judges chapter 8 verse 1, the men of Ephraim come to Gideon and they're they're fit to be tied. They're angry. Why didn't you tell us you were going to do that? Why didn't you include us in the battle? And I absolutely love Gideon's response. In verse 2, Gideon says, guys, come on. You're way better than we are. You've done so much more than we've ever done. Uh, It's not not a big deal that we conquered the Midianites without you. I mean, your, your credentials are way superior to ours. And the Bible says, when they heard this, they were no longer angry. Do you see what Gideon did? He practiced this proverb. A soft answer turns away wrath. Jephthah, another judge a few chapters later, took an alternative course with the men of Ephraim. He provoked them, which finishes up the proverb. Harsh words stir up anger. Probably my favorite example of this proverb in real time is the story of Beauty and the Beast. Not that story. I'm talking about Nabal and Abigail. She was a beauty, he was a beast. David was on the run from King Saul. He had kind of watched out for Nabal's flocks and herds, made sure nobody stole any or took advantage of Nabal. Well, when David and his men got hungry, at sheep shearing season, when Nabal would have an abundance of food, David sent men to Nabal and said, hey, can you do us a favor? We've been looking out for your possessions. We've taken care of your men. We haven't stolen anything from you. We've treated you really good. Could you in turn give us a little food? Nabal told David's men, Who is David? Who who is this guy on the run to me? You know, I've heard that a lot of servants are running away from their masters nowadays. And so he sent the men back empty-handed. When they get back to David, they say, look, David, um, he kind of insulted you, wouldn't give us any food. (laughs) David said, strap on your swords. He was seeing red. He was fit to be tied. And so David, along with 400 valiant warriors, headed toward Nabal's house. Abigail, Nabal's wife, heard about it, and she said, I better do something quick. She quickly rounded up some baked goods and went out to meet David. When she saw David, she bowed before him. She honored him as her Lord, lowercase l. Said, look, my my husband Nabal's a fool. He's an idiot. We all know that. He's hot-headed. But David, I respect you and I admire you. God is using you. You're going to do great things for the Lord. Please spare us. David relented. Because of her gracious words... David turned around and went back. God struck Nabal down and David ended up marrying Abigail. But that story fulfills this proverb. Harsh words stir up anger. Nabal was very harsh in his dealings with David. David was angry. But a soft answer turns away wrath. Her gentle response cooled the flames of David's temper. So let me ask you, as we start to wrap up, 
Are you guilty of anger sometimes? Are you willing to admit that? Are you willing to say, you know what, I do struggle with this? Maybe not always, but often. Or more than I'd care to admit. Can we be honest enough to say, I need to do better? I want to leave you with a quiz. It's a simple quiz. My favorite kind of quiz in school, by the way, true or false? You got a 50% shot either way. And we're going to call this an anger quiz, and it's just in hopes that we'll do some self-evaluation. And maybe we're saying to ourselves right now, you know, I might sometimes get a little upset, but I don't have an anger issue. Maybe that's where you're at right now. Well, okay, just do me a favor, answer true or false to these 12 questions, okay? I'm not going to score you, but score yourselves. Here we go. Number one, true or false, I fly off the handle easily. If you were standing before God and He asked you that question, you couldn't lie. True or false, I fly off the handle easily. True or false, I still get angry when I think of the bad things people did to me in the past. True or false, I don't show my anger about everything that makes me mad, but when I do, look out. True or false, waiting in line or waiting for other people really annoys me. True or false, I often find myself having heated arguments with the people who are closest to me. True or false, I sometimes lie awake at night and think about the things that upset me that day. True or false, when someone upsets me, I don't usually say anything at the time, but I later spend a lot of time thinking about cutting replies I should have used. True or false, I find it very hard to forgive someone who's done me wrong. True or false, I take frustration so badly that I cannot put it out of my mind. True or false, I've had trouble on the job because of my temper. True or false, I've gotten so upset at times, I've broken things. True or false, at times, I felt angry enough to kill someone. When I self-evaluate, when I apply those questions to my life, I got some work to do. There are times when I do fly off the handle. There are times when I don't keep my cool. It's not righteous indignation. It's just sinful anger. The reason God preserved the Bible, and in particular the book of Proverbs, is so we can learn better and do better. None of us will ever be perfect. But are we at least honest enough to say, I'm going to try to learn wisdom from Proverbs? I'm going to admit that I've got an anger issue and I'm going to try to do better. Can we commit to that at least? Anger at sin is okay. But just getting angry because the person in front of you isn't going fast enough. Because your wife burnt the toast. Because the preacher is long-winded. That's never true here, by the way, but in some churches it is. Anger is dangerous. It's often sinful. And may God help each of us to do better. Will you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, Almighty God, we bow before you so thankful that you are a loving and merciful God. That you are patient and slow to anger. Father, we want to be totally transparent and admit that we struggle with this. That anger is an issue. And we pray, Father, that you'll be with each and every one of us here. Help us to be mindful of that. Help us to work hard to do better. We're so thankful for your example. We're thankful for the example of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the book of Proverbs. Thank you for revealing these wise principles to us. And Father, we just pray that we'll make application. 
In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. If you're here this morning and not a child of God, we never wrap up without giving you that opportunity. Jesus Christ did the hard part so you could do the easy part. He died physically so you could live eternally. (laughs) That's a debt we could never repay. All he asks in return is for your love and obedience. Will you come believing on the Lord, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him openly, say, I believe with my heart that Jesus Christ really is God's Son, because He is God's Son. And then be immersed in water to have all your past sins washed away. Having contacted that blood, you'll rise up a new creature on the road that leads to heaven. We had a baptism last week, Sister Emily. We'd love to have another one today. The water's ready. We're here to encourage you. The Lord is here to receive you. If you're ready to take that step, why not come right now as together we stand and sing?